All right. So hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to the channel. Today, we're here with Josh from Quintessence NZ. And Josh is a natural health practitioner and a social entrepreneur. Yep. But I like to call him a remote wizard. Am I allowed to call you a remote wizard? Yeah. Everybody seems to be labeling me as a wizard lately, which is um, something that I'm quite happy to wear. I've always been very interested in the wizardly things of the world and I... integrating them into a more modern view. Nice. Yes. And we'll get to that. I like the combination of the wizardry with uh, modern ways of working as well and making the most of the internet. And certainly... Uh, perhaps it's a sign of your stage in life where you've elevated to wizard status. Yeah, hopefully I've, I've made it past that midlife crisis. I've turned the disaster into a master, I hope, from a saying I heard once, every master was once a disaster. For the most part, 20-year-olds don't get called wizards. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's something reserved for yeah midlife and beyond, so well done. I may, I may need to bring the beard back at some point. I think it will come at some point, yes. All yeah. right. So today's conversation is a little bit special because Josh and I, we're from the same place in New Zealand. You are working within the realm of uh, natural health and you have made your own products. Would you like to share a little bit about that and your role with e-commerce? I sort of fell into this a bit over a year ago um, when I got quite motivated by natural health products and alternative sort of therapies for things and ended up on quite a journey. Uh, which was all very synchronistic. But yeah, it's basically a pine needle and twigs extract that um, is extracted into 96% pure alcohol to get all of the soluble compounds out of it and into it and make them super bioavailable to the body. And it's been a roller coaster ride since of just redeveloping skills that I'd learned in the past, working through past traumas from businesses that and um, things that I didn't want to repeat mastering myself I guess on a physiological level as well as mental emotional all of these sorts of things I certainly did not want to go back into business again but the calling on this was so strong that I was really forced to work through these things and then customer demand right from the start just pushed me into it I had no choice Unless I wanted to run away and hide from the world again. Well, there's a lot to unpack there. And let's go back to, uh, we will get into your previous ventures um, at some stage, but let's go back to the moment where you've heard about Eastern White Pine and then decided that you would go down that pathway. Or was it Eastern White Pine specifically, or there was a problem that you were looking to solve and then you realized Eastern White Pine was the answer? Like, how did you come across deciding on that specific product? I spent a lot of time online looking at um, things kind of more in the conspiracy theory underground type of things that um, weren't so mainstream at that point. And one that kept popping up was Eastern White Pine. I was so blown away by everything that I read about it. It kind of seized me. It was very interesting. I felt like it took control, like it was a calling of sorts. Um, and I guess with a calling, your your body doesn't give you any choice. It, it pushes you into it and you have to go through the trials in order to get to the success or get to the product or whatever it is that you're developing. Because from the outside looking in, and I know I was away for some time, it seemed like a quick process to me that all of a sudden you were selling all these bottles of products online. But in your world, what was the sort of timeline from I've discovered this research about Eastern White Pine and that's all available on your website. People can take a look if they want. And what I will say is one thing I really appreciate about you, Josh, is that you have this, you have this really nice balance of being a very open-minded person and then also being very skeptical and scientific as well and I like the way that you marry the two and evidence of that can be seen on your website so what was the timeline between you identifying the eastern white pine might be uh, the resource that you're looking for and actually getting your first bottle uh, sold on the internet or sold to a person in the real world so it was probably around about four weeks wow um, 
So I was working a full-time job at the time and I came across this information. So I started looking around my neighborhood or my, my region to discover where I might be able to find some of these and ended up at local domains, which is um, areas that have been planted out over a hundred years ago with all sorts of different species and you know I ended up at the local one and inspecting every pine tree so there's a specific type of pine cone it's quite elongated and the needles are always five needles to find a a small little twig with a couple of bushels of um, needles on it and and went down to the local bottle shop bought myself a bottle of broken hearts vodka we ended up doing a quick brew so the the idea of a tincture or elixir is that you're extracting the um botanical extracts from it into an alcohol so we did that and then i got impatient it's supposed to be a four to six week process of waiting because i was so impatient i dug back into the internet again um, i'm very good at researching in all sorts of different places and also following that same synchronistic thing that i find in real life as well i, I find it it operates digitally as well as um, physically and spiritually. I ended up tracking down some information on how the Chinese extracted something called shikimic acid for um, the development of Tamiflu, which was used in, and they ramped up their production by using ultrasonic extraction, which is using high frequency sound waves. I ended up tracking one down. I ended up doing my first extraction to a similar alcohol, um, 40-50% alcohol, which I work with 96% now because I like to do everything to the umpteenth degree of what I can achieve. Uh, <laughs> so that really ramped up how quickly I could process it. Once again, I was on Trade Me looking around for different bottles. And then since then, I've ended up tracking that back through the sales process to the different people that use them and where they get them from, et cetera. And that led me back to a company called Arthur Holmes, who um, imports them from China and wholesales them to people like myself. So I use them exclusively now, and we have a very good relationship. Um, I actually bought them out of green bottles last year. So that was interesting. I had to wait over Christmas until January for them to get a new shipment in. Uh, because this has been so popular and I've been using so many of them. I ended up going on to a, not really knowing how to get it out to market. And then I posted it and it needed to be approved because it was on a Facebook group. I think my initial batch was 40 bottles. And when I went back to work, I stuck my headphones on and my email inbox was just blowing up. Ping, ping, ping over about five minutes. So I'm, I broke out my phone and had a wee look and I'm like, oh my. And within that lunch period, I sold all of the bottles. It's been a journey ever since then of perfecting how I facilitate sales and communicate with customers. Wow. So you were working in a, a factory servicing vehicles, is that correct? Yeah. I just think that's a really cool transition. How long were you in the, in the factory job for? Um, around about two years. I okay. took that job um, really to try and masculine myself up because I've always, I've had quite a feminine kind of nature, despite how masculine I look. Um, I've always had quite a emotional and psychological kind of nature, especially on the tail end of my previous business where I burnt myself out trying to keep up with demand and sales and wearing all the hats, really. My previous business, which was doing art out of vinyl records at the time. So I would take a vinyl record and use a CNC router, which is like a drill to come down, cut out shapes. So that would be designed on a computer. So it's just working with black and white silhouettes mainly. And that was a very successful business at the time. And I'm very well known in New Zealand for that. I might've done $80,000 worth of turnover in the first year and then $250,000 worth of turnover in the second year and third year became more difficult and that was related to, I sort of began this in 2015, I think it was, or late 2014, that business, and I was poised on Facebook marketing where there was no big companies using it and 
there weren't drop shippers at that time. So it was a free for all as far as putting in a small amount of money and getting an incredible reach, which is very, very hard to achieve today in advertising. And that's probably the aspect that burnt me out is that I didn't realize at the time that I was gambling. And I'd never been a gambler and I never have been a gambler. But it was quite the realization at the time that the more you're spending, and trying to work the system, hack the system, find all of the, the back doors and ways of um, negotiating with the system and the algorithm to get your message out and your product out and sold. Uh, when I first started, it was I spent 20 bucks a week. I would generate um, two and a half to four thousand dollars worth of sales a week. And it was fantastic. It was very automated, very simple. And after the second year in business, it became very, very difficult as most of the larger companies started working with Facebook marketing and the drop shipping scene came out, which is where you sell a product through a website, but you don't manage logistics. So it's shipped directly from China to the customer, which is a fantastically simple idea for, um, somebody who wants to be a nomad for instance but so much more difficult to achieve now than it was back then but one of its advantages is if you have a product that's working and selling you can scale your advertising revenue infinitely without doing any more work whereas my business as i scaled my advertising revenue because it was becoming more difficult and more costly i was also generating more personal work for myself so I would have to create and cut, frame and package and deal with more customers. And so as the scale went up, it became more difficult. I ended up using a couple of contractors, which is a very hard area to be in business, going from an independent to a medium-sized business. Uh, medium-sized business is very dangerous, I must say, uh, once you start getting into managing people, dealing with more than just your thing before you get to the large scale where you have enough people to do those things for you. So I really burnt myself out in that business. It occurred to me that I needed to step back into the workforce. And I spent that entire time studying alchemy, herbalism, Gnosticism, religion, politics. Yes, it's been quite some time since I've been in a factory myself, but certainly no stranger to them. I like the way that, you know, it would be easy to sort of, uh, disregard factory work sometimes but actually that you take a strength strengths-based approach that you are using it to your advantage uh that you also you're a father with a family to provide for so there's the added incentive to perhaps uh do that kind of work as well and you've you've said about um cultivating uh, masculinity i like to say those kinds of jobs can be character building in a factory where there's the hierarchy and the way that the people interact with each other really if you if you have an observer's mind which i know you do uh, and i do definitely <laughs> please those days are over but also they made me who i am and uh yeah no regrets there i think it's uh helpful to develop as a person to have a wide variety of experiences across many different roles, which I know that you've done. And also I'm glad that you've come out the other side now. So you're able to put your knowledge and wisdom and, and skills uh, to good use in a new way. I see sort of a theme of you uh, when you have the, the energy and the resources and the bandwidth to be focusing on uh, things that are interesting to you that align with your values that allow you to be in spaces thinking about things and supporting people and in, in ways that you're passionate about that inspire you and then going back to the original uh, e-commerce so was that your first experience with e-commerce selling the uh the record so it was records vinyl art you could get those presumably from a second hand store and yep. So the actual product that you were working with was very low cost and that uh, secondhand vinyl was, you know, sort of cents or pennies, right? Yeah. But, uh, but then it's labor intensive because you have to cut the design out. So uh, I'm thinking sometimes it was sort of iconic images, maybe something of like uh, a, a Bob Marley silhouette, things like that. Can you give us an example of some of the silhouettes you worked with? Here's one I didn't prepare earlier, but I just went and got. 
Beautiful. So that's uh I'm going to say fantail because I've been away from New Zealand for so long that I've oh PY Waka. That's the yes. the Maori name for the, the PY Waka, cheeky little fantail. Nice. And when yep. did your first year start? Uh, I think around 2014, 2015. So 2014 at a time where getting a click on Facebook to your ad in New Zealand for something like that was cents? Less than six cents at the time. Wow. So you were there at a time where you there was a wave and you're able to ride that wave. And if you can ride a wave for two years and then things change, it's still still worth doing mm. for two years, I would say. So you made the art and then what was it that prompted you to get on Facebook? Like how did you even find out or know about that world? So I hadn't done any advertising prior to that or using it as a commerce platform. I've used Shopify the whole way through. It really is made for e-commerce. It's plug and play. You just sort of throw your things in. Anything that you might be struggling with where you're like, oh, I don't know how to code, which I don't know how to code. There's an app. There's always an app that you can spend $4 a month that will facilitate that particular thing. Like for instance, I've just had to add invoicing to my current business because I'm selling into retail stores now. And I was trying to work out how to create an email and do all of the code for it to bring in the people's data, the names, all of that sort of stuff. And it was boggling. And I spent about an hour on it and then I went, oh, that's right, apps. So I searched for an invoice app on Shopify and boom, work straight away so um there's enormous resources out there within the digital realm especially if you're willing to research and there's always somebody creating a video uh, guiding or mentoring people on how to use products how to use um facebook how to use advertising resources all sorts it's all out there if you're willing to look at it like the necessity of going to well, I guess you can't even learn these things within your standard um, educational platforms these days. That was a big aspect that I found with that business when I first started operating from Timaru. There was no no support to me. I was a solopreneur. Even when I went to the chamber, local chamber of commerce or uh, my bank, they had no idea how I operated and what I did. I was a absolute misfit in the world of selling things at the time so I had to work it out all for myself and learn online how to do those things and I've always had a bit of a problem where my passion for something only lasts about six months it takes me three months to learn something six months to get bored of it in many respects sticking with that business through that hard um, next stage it was somewhat easy to walk away from when I finally got around to making the decision and doing a pros and cons type analysis of where I was at at the time and deciding that I had to let that go. Um, but I'd always been very good at letting go of jobs um, and careers within a two to three year time period because I have a very, very active mind. And yes, I work to similar sorts of time frames and also have an active mind and get rather bored. Uh, but the there's a lot to be said for this sort of uh, three-month window across many dimensions of life. But let's stick to it for the sake of uh, for work or, or ventures as I think of that, that sort of 90-day period where, depending on the complexity of the task, you've probably gone from zero to a reasonable level of comp competence within 90 days. And it's actually the same length of time that it takes for the wires in the brain, the synapses in the brain to shift and become rewired. Typically it's around 90 days. Within work I found, yeah, that, that first 90 days is very important for the learning process, but also important for uh, if you're working with other people for sort of setting the standard. And this is... Um, for expectation of how people view you. So the first impression, that first three months on the job really counts for everything. And this is from back in my naughty days when I used to drink and party and stuff like that, which I, if the audience probably doesn't know, but I don't do anymore, uh, that I had this theory that so long as you behave yourself in the first 90 days, 
<laughs> then after that period, if you fall off the wagon and you don't come to work on the Monday and, you know, you let them know, they'll be like, oh, well, we hope that she's okay, you know, the poor wee thing, because we've had this experience of her in the first 90 days that's cemented how we think about her. And now when there's a variation from that um, that sort of character that they've made up of who you are based on that first 90 days, um, they'll sort of push that to the side because it, if, if it doesn't, uh, if it conflicts with that view that they formed in the first three months. And the opposite could be true, that if for some reason um, you don't behave yourself in that first 90 days, then for the rest of your time in that workplace, it doesn't matter what you do, people have already formed their opinion from that one sort of mistake. And I'm not talking like you made a human error, I'm talking if you had a sick day or something like that in the first 90 days, um, that that there's sort of no recovering from that because of the way that people form their opinions in that sort of 90 day period. And then also in terms of um, developing skills that I'd find within that three month period, um, I've become competent. And then certainly within the two year period, by the time I get to the two year mark, and this is only for complex jobs, I'm kind of bored at that point. I've learned everything that there is to learn. I've probably done most of the learning within the first year, certainly all of it within the second year. And then the only way that I could keep it interesting is then if I start to create jobs for myself, create new roles, create projects, entrepreneurship within the role. Uh, but that can only happen in the type of workplace that's actually receptive to me behaving that way. And if they're not, then yeah, after two years, it's See you later. I so found I, a uh, interesting word in there that you used. Did you say entrepreneurship? Oh yes. With an I. Yes. It's a new one to me. How does that compare oh. with entrepreneurship? Is that internal versus external? Yes, I like the way that you're uh, breaking uh, breaking words apart and making connections from other words that you know and understand to make sense of a new word you haven't heard before. We I do a think... lot of this, don't we, Talia? <laughs> <laughs> well, I. We uh, have a lot of similarities, but I didn't realize that you have, or maybe you've told me and then I forgot, but I saw it on your website today, your appreciation for etymology, the, stud the study and history of words, which I also have an appreciation for etymology. Yes, so entrepreneurship, for, for anyone who doesn't know, is when you behave in entrepreneurial ways within the workplace. So it's if you've got an entrepreneurial mind, but for whatever reason you you want employment at that time, or maybe you're someone who has an entrepreneurial mind, but you want or need the security of a job that's paying regularly, uh, then you can be an entrepreneur in the workplace, which is creating your own projects and ideas or coming up with solutions for problems and things like that. Some workplaces and some leaders are far more receptive to that type of behavior than others. Indeed, yeah. But that's how I like to be. So if I can't be like that in a workplace, it's unlikely that I'll stay because then I'll just get bored. How do you feel in that journey? Uh, it's a question that I've got about what it feels like to be doing something when no one else in your radius is behaving or thinking in those ways, for the most part. And have you had anyone, um, any pushback from anyone about doing the e-commerce or uh, going remote? which I know you only did last year, 2023. I guess no, no pushback whatsoever because it fits within the thing of it's outside of most people's understanding. So I definitely found within the local community that there was, there was no pushback, but there was limited receptivity. So all of my businesses so far, both of them have, have been successful on a national and international scale. And it takes that external success within um, the national framework for people to finally go, oh, these are really popular. Maybe we should try it. But I've definitely found with both that there's been a very, very slow integration locally. That business was also international, are shipping all around the world, but mainly to Australia just because uh, the shipping costs into Australia were a lot more approachable than the shipping costs over a longer distance. So for the most part, it lasted about two years. Is that right? Yeah, it would have been about two and a half years. I made a fundamental mistake. I could no longer buy frames to do my art. So I was buying frames through Briscoe's when they were 50% off because Briscoe's in New Zealand, you never go there unless they've got a sale and they've just about always got a sale. <laughs> so I would uh, wait until they were 50% off every couple of weeks and I would buy 
a big pile of them. I ended up returning a lot of the damaged ones. There was a lot of damaged ones. They made a decision that that product wasn't viable for them anymore because of the amount of returns. And I probably had a huge influence on that compared to the regular customer who might forget to even take it back to the shop and get their refund. Whereas I had to, I couldn't afford to throw that money away. I ended up trying to make my own frames. I sold heaps. And then I started to get these feedback with a line, a broken area here or here on one corner or all the way across from one to the other. And I'd never had broken glass or issues before even shipping over to Australia. I created my own um, packaging, had a die made for it, um, created all the internal structure. I could roll one of my things down the hill of my property, end over end, flippity, 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 without it breaking anything inside. So I knew right. I had a very robust packaging system. Was, but Was that actually part of your quality control procedure? Yeah. <laughs> I love I, it. I am very um, pedantic on um, dust and cleanliness and all these other bits and pieces when it comes to producing a product. And I ended up shipping these all off overseas, many of them to Australia. And then within a week, I had emails just telling me that there'd been broken glass, etc. And some people just took it to their local glazers and got a new piece of glass. And other people were irate and wanted it replaced. So they would send it back broken and I would have to cover the shipping in both directions and replace the art um, if it was damaged as well. And that ended up getting me into a little bit of debt because a lot of my business structure at the time, which I don't do now, so I've built various things into my new business based on um, these things that I've, mistakes that I made in my past one, which was using credit. Um, so I had credit with New Zealand Post, et cetera, and I was able to use that New Zealand Post credit to get all of that shipping effectively for free to try and get me ahead. But the scale of the mistake that I made at the time meant that I generated a big bill, then I had a tax bill, which I hadn't allowed for, and I ended up about $20,000 in debt, which to most people doesn't seem like a lot, but when you're a young family paying a mortgage, doing all these sorts of things, that's a considerable amount of money and I don't enjoy debt in any shape or form anyway. So the compromises of having a mortgage was already pretty high. I wasn't into that either, but had surrendered to it. I ended up selling the business for $20,000 and had to pay everybody. Even though I was a limited liability company, I paid all of my creditors within the next few weeks and it started from scratch again. The idea is as a limited liability, you can... Um, put the liability on your company rather than yourself. There was only one person that actually let me do that, and that was my accountant. They were like, oh, no, we've just written it off. And I was like, oh, great. I have $1,600. Yay. <laughs> nice. Well, you don't hear that from accountants every day, so that's something good to hear. So these days, as part of my new business, I don't do any credit whatsoever, and I don't even provide it to retailers who want to buy my product. So if they want to buy it, I give them a discount and they just purchase it outright. Yeah, so I really think this is a very powerful uh, notion is that you have had experiences in the past. I don't know if you call a business that made 300K or more over the space of two years a failed business just because it ended. To me, it sounds like a success. Things don't have to go mm. forever to be successful. So that's two years worth of success. And then you've had these challenges with, um, you know, it's a whole other level of challenge if people are wanting to ship uh, and sell, you know, real tangible products as opposed to digital products. Uh, and this is a challenge that you've been willing to take on the second time round, even if you're doing things a, a little or a lot differently. So there's the challenge of the physical products. There's learning about uh, not going into debt. So I guess in a way, boot, bootstrapping where possible, funding your own business. So not going into debt, not getting investment or things like that, investing in yourself with your time, energy, resources, and you know whatever money it is that you have to begin with, and then making the product, selling the product, and then using some of the profit from the product to reinvest back into the business. That's how you're approaching things now. Nice. It's definitely, definitely the way to do it. And it's, you know, it's not actually that easy. I've got to be very um, careful. Like, for instance, over Christmas, I had a bit of a drop in sales because of um, 
people re reprioritize away from their well-being over Christmas. So they've got gifts. They'll choose to drink and eat and be merry. So there was a limited sales. It probably dropped by about half over the December and early January period. I run reasonably low, close to the edge, usually have a float of a few thousand dollars. So my float got down below that $1,000 mark over that period, which basically means my float is always there because I need to buy merchandise. I need to buy bottles. I need to buy alcohol, um, shipping labels, all these sorts of things, pay for websites. So I'm well aware that I always need to be above $2,000 in that account and that was a little bit of a, a wee bit of a slap for me but because of the way that I've built things out it just meant that I scaled back what I was doing so instead of buying 330 bottles um, of these little glass bottles I scaled back to buying 50. Um, it was like that when I first started my business as well because I had limited resources but I was backed up by having a full-time job at the time. So I was side hustling at the time. In the early days, that worked incredibly well because it was limited supply, so supply and demand. So I would constantly be sold out and then I would get another 50 bottles in. I would let people know and they would disappear within an hour. And then within three days through the e-commerce platform, I would have all of my money with um you know sales fees and all that sort of stuff taken off it um and then i'd reinvest and i'd just keep doing that and because there's a wee bit of profitability there uh, reasonably low at the beginning i was underselling myself because as you know it's that humanitarian side of me wants to do it cheap for so everybody can have it not mm -hmm. just the people who can afford it but the people who can't afford it as well nice and so also, I want to just um, tag a little bit about the previous uh, experience where I know that you had some trouble with the customers and and you'd gone into debt, but also there was a, a sort of an, a mental and emotional toll with uh, perhaps overloading yourself, um, maybe under underestimated. Yeah. Because how's anyone to know, especially if you haven't seen someone and you haven't you haven't really been there for the process of someone else running their own e-commerce business so you kind of can bite off more than you can chew uh in the early stages and then uh, who can say no to the sales once they're rolling in so of course you're going to do everything you can to meet that demand and so you can kind of even though you've got your own business and you're your own boss and you're in control now you can still create a hamster wheel for yourself with the best of intentions so it sounds as though uh, you sort of unintentionally created a bit of an overwhelming hamster wheel for yourself in the previous business, and that may have been part of the reason why you closed it down. So how did you yeah. approach things differently? Because I know that you were hesitant to step into your own business and e-commerce again based on, I'm guessing, the physical, mental, and emotional toll from the previous time, even though you had success. So this time you're building a new business again. You were you were doing it whilst as a side hustle whilst working full time and how long was that period from when quintessence was a, a side hustle something you're spending a few hours on a week i think it was less than six months my previous business it was made to order as well so there was a lot of custom stuff where people would pick the record label i actually put pictures of all the record labels on the website and made them a free product so you would buy your design for a price and then you would pick your record label. And it took me a while to work out how to facilitate that and make it more simple without having to send people pictures or flip through a thing and go, well, this one or this one. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was making that easier, but everything was made to order. So I was always on this um, hamster wheel, as you say, of a week's timeline to get that thing out and out to people. And I really noticed with customers that it was a real pain point or a pinch point that they, once they've given somebody their money, they want that thing immediately. It, it incites fear and insecurity in them that they're potentially getting ripped off, especially at that time with um, e-commerce because it wasn't as popular as it is now. So people weren't as comfortable with giving out their credit card details and so on online. Um, there was a lot of fear about being ripped off or losing your details. So 
my current business, I have a few rules that I stick to absolutely. <laughs> Those are around not having any debt. Um, so that takes an entire load off myself. Um, the other one is I only sell what I have in stock. So I have to produce the product before I even put it up for sale because I want people, most of these people, are um, they're in a, a health crisis at the time when they're hitting me up for products. So um, there's an added level of stress and anxiety for them around having that product as quickly as possible. So I ship the very next day. I get up every morning and I package everything that was sold the previous day and take it to the post shop. A lot of that's automated through the um, the Shopify platform. So I just scan the barcode on it. It sends an automated email to them, letting them know it's been shipped and what their tracking details are. I don't have to collect any money because I don't sell anything on credit. I do a lot of discounting. I built in a reciprocity system. To me, reciprocity is uh, people allowing other people to access resources that they can't access themselves. So I created a reciprocity discount and tipping system in my current business where um, people can tip at checkout. It's just there, easy. And I've had that at different percentages over the time. Um, and then I have a discount. I've always had a discount on the on the website freely available called Reciprocity, where people can choose on their first purchase to get that discount. I've done the same thing with my wholesaling into retail at the moment. I've created automatic discount codes. And on the retailers page, I've created a whole outline of what my rules are around it and what they're allowed to sell for. The fact that I don't provide any credit accounts because I simply can't afford to, you know, that money has to be there for me to work with. Yeah, it's it's really for me is about simplifying all of these things that were, that crushed me and caused me burnout in the past. It's a human crisis. It's something that you have to physically, mentally, or whatever it is, reprogram your brain, um, which involves re-experiencing and reformatting how you perceive events in your life and creating frameworks for avoiding um, those same triggers. So this entire business has been around working through the simplification and ease of use for me of what I do, which allows me to work hard in the morning, to work really hard for a period of time when I'm doing extractions. And then I quite often spend a few hours at the beach or at the park with my dog in the afternoon. And then I'll get back to doing messages and creating art around my business. So I still implement things that I've learned in the past. I also work with ChatGPT for, so I've got a paid subscription with that, that allows me to do research and development using that as an ally, which is something I didn't have in my last business. As I said, I had nobody to look up to. Um, whereas I can use ChatGPT to browse the entire internet for me within a few seconds and give me quite viable feedback or information on what steps I need to take next. And I've used that a lot in um, this process, especially now that I'm getting into retail, legitimizing the business, creating a different type of label. So it's a dietary supplement label. It's not just me running kind of underground like I used to. I've had to tick all of these boxes and register a kitchen. Now I'm using ChatGPT to research export requirements for going into Australia because it's very different. Like a piece of art exporting into Australia, you just send it. But if it's a food item, a medical item, all of these sorts of things, there's so many rules and boxes to tick. So. ChatGPT has been hugely powerful. I think the best way to approach it would be perhaps to have another chat in, let's say, a month's time or something like that so that we can cover some other topics because I know you've touched on burnout, which is a huge topic for me and something I've had to, I experienced myself and twice actually, didn't learn my lesson the first time and uh, have gone down the rabbit hole of learning about that. And and so that could be a whole hour long conversation in itself. And then also um, talking about chat GPT and 
it could also be interesting to see some of your processes like to do a screen share so we can actually see uh how you're approaching some of these tools if you're interested so we can we can have a chat about that at a later stage because you're just a fountain of knowledge with all of this sort of thing and uh i'd really like to wrap up with you know you've said that you you are using tools to um help support you to take some of the workload off uh, so you're not having to do things manually and you're not going into debt at all um, on either side and you're making sure that you this is a really good way to avoid the hamster wheel that you're not selling products that you don't actually have in-house so you're not allowing people to um, pre-order things because of course when the pre-orders come in then you really have to get on the hamster hamster wheel and run on that to deliver and you're right people don't want to wait if I end up maximum seven days, but I'd expect my tracking number within 24 to 48 hours. And if I don't have that tracking number within that period, I'm starting to think, has my is my order gone missing? Has the package gone missing? Certainly if the package doesn't arrive within seven days, I'll think that it's gone missing or been stolen. So yes, and it's the the uncertainty I think that people struggle with of when is it coming and is it coming at all. Um, so I think these ideas are really interesting that you've you've put these sort of um, frameworks in place to make sure that you avoid falling into the same patterns from before. But in terms of your own wellness and well-being and being a human at the helm of this business, what are the signs or things that you would sense or check in with to either make sure that you stay within boundaries of being well as a solopreneur or make sure that you avoid things that could potentially be harmful to your self-care or well-being? Yeah, well, I have to be um, very careful with my health because I have an underlying health condition that's been going on for about five years since about the time that I finished my um, record art business. So that has caused me this highs and lows, um, chronic fatigue, um, vertigo, headaches, swollen glands, sciatica is one that really shows up as well. So my body is actually under constant stress from that process and the toxicity and the working through um, stuff with that. So I have a predisposition to stress within my body anyway. Um, so my creating tools around that is hugely important because I'm adding extra onto that, um, with what I'm doing as a business. I think the main ones that I notice is probably the breath is the first place that it shows up for me. And when I first started this business, I noticed that when I was doing packaging and processes related to it. And I love packaging, which is really weird. It's like one of my favorite parts of it is creating a, a good packaging system that works really well. Um, but the breathing will become short and you'll forget to breathe. So you find yourself holding your breath, holding an inhale or holding an exhale and then catching that breath. And that causes a stress anxiety in the chest as well and it's one of my main towels it was one of the main tools that I used to work through um, the P the PTSD from the previous business when I started in this one so I would constantly catch myself and then as I was doing that process I would focus on taking full breaths so the process was reasonably methodical uh, much like servicing cars um, once you know what you're doing, you're doing it. But rather than listening to something on my headphones, I would be maintaining that consistent breath, which completely reprogrammed my nervous system around stuff to do with that, which is very interesting and very simple. Nice. Yes, I love that. But actually, uh, and these are things that I discovered post recovering from burnout is how crazy it is that um, these simple tools of just regular deep breathing can actually alleviate and elim eliminate um, health conditions and symptoms that you're having from burnout. But of course, 
I mean, yeah, people are out there selling uh, breathing courses and packages and things like that. But for the most part, these types of solutions, I feel like aren't publicized because no one can make money off it. But mm. you can create so much wellness for yourself just by regulating your breathing. And then also you're teaching your system, teaching your nervous system. I'm working on a business. I'm shipping out these products but I'm breathing deeply and consistently, which means that this process is safe and I'm not in danger. Yeah, pretty much. Um, I think I discovered it through, if looking back, was learning about how the SAS or the Army used breathing techniques within their training to train people to use those different breathing techniques in different scenarios. There's a whole heap, you know, you can do these cyclic breathings of um, taking a breath, holding a breath, releasing a breath for the same periods of time. Um, and you can get into all sorts of states through breathing. I've experimented with that a lot while I was studying psychology as well. But for me, it's just a consistent in and out breath while I'm working. It just simplifies it. Also difficult to do while you're talking like this because you have to create a pause so I noticed that even in this interview format that we're doing, a propensity to limit my breathing because I have the ability to talk for a sustained period of time about interesting things and keep my train of thought. So I have to pause and have a breath. Yes, and I'm breathing now, now that you've mentioned it, but actually if I'm not conscious, I can forget to breathe. So that's like a, a lifelong habit pattern to be rewritten but thank you for the reminder to do some conscious deep breathing all right so thank you for sharing your knowledge with us josh i really hope that we can get you on to have another chat because i know we're just like skimming the surface today mm -hmm. and i really think um, it's really powerful to see how your new business is built off the back of the knowledge and skills and experiences from your previous business and i love this idea of you creating, uh, I think it's a really powerful idea to get out there, you creating a business that fits around you and your lifestyle and your well-being and your health to prioritize yourself at the center because I know it's, and your family and what's important to you and also the people that you're generously helping with, with the products that you're providing as well. I know you've created a rich community around the product too. Yes, yeah, so to see that you're, prioritizing your health and well-being in amongst a commercial venture is I would say like the new and improved and future way of solopreneurship and that's what I'd like to see people thinking about in advance it would be ideal if people didn't have to go through a burnout to then decide to reconfigure their lifestyle and their business to best support their health and well-being but I, I mean, maybe some people get to that place without having to experience the burnout. I know for me, it's the suffering that's reminded me how important it is to take care of myself. I'm not sure if I could have learned it the easy way. It's a lesson that needed to be learned the hard way, uh, but it's a really good reminder. So thank you. Mm, I think that's, it really is at the root of wisdom versus knowledge, you know, is, is actually a suffering process. You know, you can you can listen to all the interviews you want and so on, but until you practically implement something and experience it in the body, um, you don't grok it. And grok's a word that's just recently come out and been used by Elon Musk for his latest thing. And I think it comes from a book I read a few years ago called The Man from Mars. They had a word on Mars, which was grok, which was to understand something with your body. Ah, yeah, to really bring it down into your body, into your toes, like right down. The somatic experience, yeah. yeah. Nice. Well, that's another <laughs> that's another topic that we could go off. I in think we're going hour. to be doing uh, <laughs> probably four interviews yeah. of an hour and a half each by the looks of things. Nice. All right. Well, hey, thank you so much for sharing. So if people are interested and they want to hear more, they want to uh, look at your product, look at your website, where should they go? Uh, the easiest um, drop-off is quintessence.nz. It's a big, long, kind of weird word that's easily forgotten. So I'll repeat quintessence. I'll put it in the link. Um, but it has a lot of meaning to me. It's an alchemical term that relates to purity and truth and spirit 
and these sorts of things. So it really embodies what I'm trying to do. So quintessence was a very good choice. Uh, the other option is just search, search for Eastern White Pine um, on Google or on Facebook, and you'll probably come across me. I can do any advertising in this business. All of my business is based on word of mouth this time. So I've eliminated that issue from my business as well, which is probably another whole topic we could talk about as well. Yes. Uh, so where is the community that you're engaging with? Is that a Facebook group? Or... Predominantly on a Facebook group called Eastern White Pine NZ. Okay. And would people be invited to that group if they wanted to join? Um, or... you, can jo you can join the group and then I, um, I sort of check everybody out to see um, whether they are local related to the product that type of thing uh, i'm not quite poised for international yet so i tend to reject people from overseas i'm starting to build a few people from australia but um, people in america and europe and so on i'll tend to just decline their thing because i can't be bothered uh, answering the same question over and over boundaries hey Boundaries yeah, are so important boundaries. with wellness. Yeah. So we need to, yeah, recognize where we recognize the humanity and whatever it is that we're doing. And certainly it's nothing personal, but for the sake of self-protection and sustainability, that you have a clear line uh, that you don't cross to look after yourself. And I really respect that and uh, and hope that the that the viewers will too. So thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Thank for you sharing. so much for your uh, interview. It's been really good to process and tell my story again in a in a longer kind of format. I think we've probably covered things that you didn't even know about me um, previous to this interview. So you've done a very good job of digging into and revealing some of the aspects that make up the alchemy that is the wizardry of Josh. <laughs> Thank you, Josh. All right. We'll chat soon. Thank you.